Hello, friends, and welcome. It's your boy, Lart with Lart Media, and this is the Lart Media Podcast, episode 003, Revenge of the Larth. My name is Lathan Minnick, a.k.a. Larth. This is my podcast. Uh, what's on the docket today? I'm going to talk a little bit about the podcast uh, briefly, just about where I, where I am with uh, producing it. I spoke on the previous episode about how I took four months off. Um, I say took four months off like it was a plan. No, it just kind of happened. I was dealing, you know, I was dealing with myself basically without going into too much detail. But, yeah, I was just in a place where I, I just I wasn't productive and I didn't feel like doing anything. So, of course, this. uh this podcast, this project, this, you know, whatever, this has lain idle for a few months. Um, but I'm going to go into that a little bit. Um, the the major meat, the bulk of this podcast episode will be a Spider-Man No Way Home review. And I must say, I'm, I'm quite excited about that. Uh, I mean, I'm excited to talk about the movie, but also... Like through all of this, like, you know, planning for the podcast and there's like there's so much stuff that I recorded over the years that (laughs) God willing will never see the light of day. And there's I don't know if I ever completed one, but there's a number of like movie reviews that I recorded. And that's one of the things that I was mm, I was most excited about. I mean, I talked about, you know, how I'm so much I'm getting so much more into film in recent years and. Yeah, I mean, just the idea of doing, I don't want to do like a, just like a movie review vlog, like, you know, whatever, Jeremy Johns and Chris Duckman, they're kind of the big ones on YouTube. And of course, this is a podcast as well. So, you know, there's an audio only audience as well. So anyway, um, I'm kind of rambling on that. As I said, this is the Larth Media Podcast, episode 003, Revenge of the Larth. Um, let me go into the contact info real quick. If you want to reach me, the email address is Larth. No, it's not Larth. Excuse me. <laughs> it's LarthMedia at gmail.com. And any of the social media followings is going to be Larth Media at Larth Media on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok. I have a Facebook fan page, uh, facebook.com slash Larth Media. This podcast is being recorded on video as well as audio, so it is available on my YouTube channel. Um, It's just search for Larth Media. I don't have a personalized link yet. I need to get, I think it's like 100 subscribers or something before I can get like a, you know, an exclusive uh, discrete um, URL for my YouTube channel. Okay, so the podcast, the podcast, the podcast, where are we at, Lathan? So, like I said, I took the four months off um, for reasons discussed previously. Um, I recorded my second episode on my birthday, which was February 23rd. At a certain point, I feel like I shouldn't be giving out these dates of when this is happening. Because I'm and I'm going to get to a point where I'm recording like episode, episode after episode. And I don't know, maybe these dates might confuse things or. Or they might show just how long these episodes are taking to be put up. Uh, so, yeah, so I'm getting I'm getting back into it. I recorded the last episode on February 23rd, as I said. So that was less than two weeks ago. Um, I haven't uploaded it yet. I I worked on it. It's funny thing, like most of this work, most of the stuff, most of the hang ups that I'm having with this podcast are video. And then I have to ask myself, am I that concerned with the video? Um, And you know what? I am. I'm I'm excited about the video platform as well as the audio platform. Okay, I can hear a siren in my headphones right now. I don't know if that's showing up on the mic. I, you know, I don't want to fuss over exterior exterior noise like I did in the uh, first episode. But then I hear that and I just, I get a little, um, I get a little nervous. Like, oh my God, it's going to mess up the podcast. 
So yeah, and today, getting back to what I was talking about, today is March 7th. So less than two weeks after recording episode two, I'm recording episode three. And see, I don't want to say things I haven't done yet in case I don't do them. But you know what? It's it's just going to happen. I just need to, I'm, I'm just going to keep trudging forward. So the thing that's going to happen tomorrow is um, I'm going to watch Batman. The Batman, starring Robert Battinson, directed by Matt Reeves. Uh, looking forward to that. I watched Spider-Man No Way Home today. That was the um, that was the second time I watched the film. Um, but just to close up on the uh, the podcast before I get to the film, because I really want to get to that film. So as I said, I'm recording. I'm basically recording two episodes in two concurrent days at least i'm recording the first one right now and i plan to record the second one tomorrow so i watched spider-man no way home today for the second time and i'm recording the you know <clears throat> the podcast episode covering it and then tomorrow i'll be watching the batman and i will be recording the podcast directly thereafter so i guess that'll be episode uh four zero zero four. Ooh, a new hope I like the sound of that for that episode. Anyway, I think that's about it. Um, I'm so excited to get to talking about the film that I, I'm I'm just going to cut the other stuff short. Um, so I'm going to get into it. Spider-Man No Way Home 2021. Uh, full spoiler warning. I'm not even worried about spoilers. Okay, I'm not going to have like a non-spoiler section and a spoiler section like some may. Um, this is full spoilers. And I mean, the movie's been out for almost three months now. It's December, January, January, February. Yeah, like two and a half months. Honestly, I feel like, I, I mean, I don't know all the business side of it, but I feel like if this was a a pre-pandemic box office, it, it, it wouldn't be there anymore. It would have been pushed out by something else. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, but I checked the box office right before, um, right before I recorded this, and that movie has brought in $1.86 billion, according to Google. So that's, I mean, that, that, that looks like a pre-pandemic number to me. Number, excuse me. Because I, I don't know how the movie theaters, I mean, I'm sure they have their expectations. I'm sure they have like calculations of how much they expect the movie to make. And I'm sure they have calculations for COVID and how many how many people are coming in. And I would think that even now, like the movie theaters would be doing less business. But I mean, based on that number, I mean, I don't it doesn't look like they're going to hit two billion. But hell, they're coming up on two billion with that film, and congrats to them. Uh, it's been a great trilogy. For the most part, I'll, I'll talk in more detail about that as we go along. So, repeating myself, as I said, Spider-Man: No Way Home, uh, 2021, directed by John Watts, written by Chris McKenna and Eric Summers. Um, starring, of course, Tom Holland as Peter Parker slash Spider-Man. Zendaya as... She's not Mary Jane. She's Michelle Jones Watson. Which is, you know, it's different. Benedict Cumberbatch as Doctor Strange, of course. He's he's always been great as Doctor Strange. Um, we got Jacob Batalon, which is a Filipino name. He's a Pinoy brother. Uh right he was born right here in honolulu hawaii i didn't read up on his whole life story but i know he was born here he spent i don't know some of his childhood here um so i mean that's great it's good to see like someone local being a being a big movie like this uh we have andrew garfield and toby Maguire, of course there's the you know the multiverse tie-ins with the uh, multiple spider-men that I mean, obviously, that was one of the biggest draws of this movie. I mean, just from a like a nerdgasm standpoint, 
Like, oh my God, multiple Spider-Man in one Spider-Man movie. And really, um, that's one of those things. Of course, I mean, this trilogy has been pretty solid. Um, that's one of those things that, like, you know, Hollywood. Like, they take something cool like that, and they, they could have just shoved it into, like, a really bad movie. But the way um, this movie turned out, I mean, yeah, there's, there's a whole bunch of nerdgasm, references, Easter eggs in this film. But it doesn't get in the way of the story and, you know, the film itself. Like the action, there's a bunch of great action, but it's in service to the story. It's not just action for the sake of action. Uh, but anyway, moving on with the cast. Um, <clears throat> finishing out, we have John Favreau as Javi Hogan, of course. Uh, John Favreau, of course, um, directed Iron Man's 1 and 2. And, I mean, he was a big part of kicking off the MCU. Uh, and it's always good to see Javi Hogan. Jamie Foxx as Electro, Willem Dafoe as the Green Goblin, and Alfred Molina as Doc Ock. Okay, so let's talk about the plot to Spider-Man No Way Home. Um, so Spider-Man, recently outed by Mysterio in the previous film, Far From Home, uh, everybody, they say it multiple times in the movie that he's the most famous man on the planet now. Because, you know... Because he's Spider-Man, it's, it's such a big controversy. Um, so he's outed. Uh, because of that, his friends, well, I mean his girlfriend, obviously MJ, and his friend Ned, they get denied. Um, their applications to MIT get denied. All three of them, you know, applied to MIT. And they all opened the letters together, and they all got denied. And it actually, they actually read the letters, and the, re the excuse me, the, the letters say, in light of recent... In light of recent controversy, um, we 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 cannot accept your application. Um, that part, I mean, that that was a little on the nose. I mean, that's that's a movie thing, but I feel like in real you know, real life, I feel like you know something like that would be handled a lot more passive aggressively if some big institution, you know, turned somebody down because of controversy or something that is not really about their academic qualifications to attend the school or any other factor. It's just about, oh, we don't like this thing. I feel like their applications just would have been denied without. Anyway, moving forward. So because of this, Spider-Man feels bad. He goes to Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange, can you turn back time? Doctor Strange says, no, I don't have the time stone anymore. And he also says, I'm not going to... He mentions, I don't know exactly what he says, but he mentions about what they did in Endgame that we we tampered with the space-time continuum or something to save countless lives. And you want me to do it again because yours is messy. He's got a point. But somewhere along the line with the help of Wong, they figure out that I mean, Doctor Strange just gets the idea that he can cast a spell where everybody in the world forgets that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. Basically reversing what Mysterio just did. Um, so Spider-Man's like, yeah, great, do that. And then as Doctor Strange is, um, is casting the spell, he says, well, Peter, it's been nice knowing you which means I'm not going to remember you after this. And then he explains to Peter, yeah, no one's going to, even your friends and family and people who you want to know are Spider-Man will not know you are Spider-Man. So Peter starts freaking out and he says, oh, well, what about MJ? Can we, can we change the spell? Dr. Strange changes the spell. Um, and then Peter Parker goes, oh, well, what about Ned? And so, like, you know, there's these magical rings floating around uh, Doctor Strange. It started with one, with the one spell. And then as as every time Peter makes a change, there's, like, another ring, and then another ring, and then another ring. Uh, at the end, Doctor Strange says something about uh, you made, and he said you made six. You made six um, adjustments to that spell in the middle of casting it, which is bad, I guess. 
um peter peter uh peter re, uh, replies five not six um so yeah so that essentially we find out later that that so those adjustments to the spell meant that this person knows spider-man is peter parker this person knows that you know spider-man is peter peter parker spider-man so on so on and so we find out later that because the spell got corrupted or whatever happened everyone in the multiverse who knows peter parker is spider-man are being like attracted into our world into our universe and so that's what leads to the multiple villains from different movies in the film the multiple spider-men of course um well the multiple spider-men weren't attracted by the fact that they knew peter parker or spider-man it's later in the film where they're looking for their peter and they end up pulling well no they didn't pull the other peters from another universe those peter parkers were already in their universe so yeah no i guess they were in our universe because they knew peter parker was spider-man uh so I mean, the second act, the first act just sets everything up, you know, with the with the spell and everything. Um, the second act is mostly first confronting, confronting the villains and then kind of befriending them because he like he confronts Doc Ock, played by Alfred Molina. Kind of. I mean, he fought with him for a bit. I don't I wouldn't say he easily defeated him. But once like the that nanobot thing happened. So basically, if you haven't seen the film, uh, Spider-Man and Doc Ock are fighting. Uh, Spider-Man's got his uh, his nanotech uh, Spider-Man suit from, you know, from uh, Infinity War and Endgame. And uh, Doc Ock's like octopus arm, like kind of grabs him right here and pulls off a bunch of the pulls off basically a bunch of his suit, which, of course, is nanotech. But then the nanotech kind of, I don't know, at first, like, Doc Ock is, is um, he's excited, like, ooh, nanotechnology, and it's, like, going into his arms, and you think, like, it's going to make him stronger or something. But, no, it means that it means that uh, Peter can basically take over his suit because it's, you know, it's stark technology, it's nanotech. I mean, I'm buying it. It basically took over that technology um, of those arms. And so, basically, okay, Doc Ock's defeated. Um and so he takes him back to i don't know wherever they were keeping them they were keeping all these villains in a certain spot was it the dungeon yeah i think it was like they called it the wizard's dungeon um and the same thing like they meet jamie fox's electro there's a little fight and then i, I forget how that one ends but at one point he has them all captured so yeah, I wasn't really befriended. He kind of, he kind of befriends them because he's telling them, "You guys don't belong here. I want to send you back to your home universe." So I mean, he's trying to help them out, which is a very Spider-Man thing. Uh, in in hindsight, I was thinking about it: is that Spider-Man tries to help everyone, even those who hurt him. The fact that he's trying so hard to help people who want to hurt him. I mean, that's. I think that's kind of Spider-Man's thing. It's part of his character. Uh, so yeah, I'm 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 rambling here. I'm getting I'm getting off topic. Uh, I was in the second act. So basically, they're setting up that Peter Parker is going to. He's gonna fix all of them, and and at first he wants to send them all back to their own universe. But then it is revealed that which of them. I think they said all of them died. I know they said uh, Doc Ock and, I, of course, I remember. No, I, I recently watched Spider-Man 2, the 2004 one with Doc Ock. I know he dies in that one. I know Green Goblin dies in the 2002 one. Uh, but so basically they, re they reveal the idea that, I don't know, if all or I think they said all of them. I, I'm not even sure. Um, but that, that that's kind of a that becomes a kind of a plot point. 
they realized that they were all they were all killed fighting Spider-Man. Not that Spider-Man killed them. So I guess maybe I shouldn't say killed, but they all died fighting Spider-Man. Of course, he always gets the blame. But, you know, as you know, we saw 2002 Spider-Man, Green Goblin killed himself. Doc Ock. Evil falls in upon itself, it said. Doc Ock was responsible for his own death. So the the plot point that is that is revealed here is that when he sends them back to their universe, they're dead. Yeah, yeah, no, no, now I remember. I remember um, they're all telling stories about because Alfred Molina sees Norman Osborn. He says, you're dead, not knowing that he is dead as well. But then they all find out amongst themselves that they all died. And right before they were going to pass on, they got pulled to this universe. So I don't know there's like a time space thing going on there, which is kind of fascinating. Um, and so, I mean, Jamie Foxx as Electro, definitely uh, Green Goblin, Willem Dafoe's Green Goblin. He kind of goes back and forth. Sometimes he's Norman Osborn, somewhat normal. Sometimes he's the Green Goblin. The two of them are like, fuck that. I don't want to die. And so they they start. Like Jamie Foxx is Electro, even from the very beginning, like he was talking about how the energy in our universe feels different and he likes it. So they're I mean, they're setting up that he was going to he was going to pull some shit at some point. Um, stay on point, stay on point, Lathan, stay on point. Summary, plot summary. So, yeah, the second act is him coming up with this plan to send them home, them realizing or most of them realize that they don't want to go home because that mean basically means they're dead. Uh, they they start. Who gets. I think the one. The one villain of amongst the main villains that gave Spider-Man the least trouble was Doc Ock because he had that one fight. And then, you know, uh, Spider-Man kind of <laughs> subdued him with the nanotech. And then there's like a little bit where he kind of he kind of breaks out and acts crazy later in the film. But for the most part, he was pretty tame. It was Jamie Foxx as Electro and, of course, Willem Dafoe as Green Goblin that you know, became kind of the, the main villains uh, in this film. Green Goblin, definitely, as we'll soon learn. Um, so, yeah, fighting happens. Action happens. Uh, basically, <laughs> end of the second act, Aunt May dies. Uh, I remember... Cause she, they do this thing like where she's kind of standing there and she's normal and she says the, she doesn't say uh, with no with um, no power, <laughs> with great power comes great responsibility. She doesn't say exactly like that. They changed it up a little bit, which I can see why they did that. But I don't know. It just sounded kind of awkward. They could I don't know. Maybe they could have written it a little bit differently. I believe she says uh, with great power must also come great responsibility. And she goes hmm. At the end. Um, then we realize that she's suffered some, you know, some mortal injury and that she's dying. Again, I feel like they were just changing it up. But the no. I know we don't want to do the exact same thing we've done with every other incarnation of Spider-Man. I feel like this is why they didn't do it. But. The great power with no, with uh, <laughs> no responsibility, which is kind of a theme of this movie. Um, I'll get back to that later. Summarize the episode theme. Um, the great power comes great responsibility line should be said as she's dying. That's, I mean, again... They were trying to do something different, but that's the dramatic kick right there. <sighs> okay, so we're at the end of the second act. Um, 
in filmmaking terms, uh, the second act is the lowest point for our hero. And, you know, truth be told, this is his lowest point. Uh, Aunt May is dead. He's getting, I mean, just that shot, that closing shot of the second act is of him on that roof and J. Jonah Jameson in, on this huge screen talking about, you know, how Spider-Man's a menace and how he's responsible for all these things that have happened. So that that is our lowest point for, for Peter Parker. And then we go into... Yeah, we go into the third act. And the third act is when they when they bring in the when they bring in Andrew Garfield and and Toby Maguire. This in filmmaking terms, the beginning of the third act, end of the second act, hero heroes, if you will, because you know, MJ and Ned, they're they're part of the protagonist too. Um our heroes start working against the problem. So basically, um, we've established that Ned can, apparently he can do the, uh, I, I don't know how he would do it. I'm, I'm doing, I'm doing the, the thing on the video that Dr. Strange does. He has a little, I don't know what they call it, something ring. He gets it. I, I remember when he, in the Dr. Strange movie, he gets it. I forget what it's called, but it allows him to make all those portals. And then, uh, Ned steals that from him. And then we establish that Ned can can apparently he's <laughs> he's got the magic. He he has a funny line about how like, oh my grandma said that that I have the magic and sometimes like my I feel a little tingle in my fingers. And Doctor Strange is like, yeah, you need to go see a doctor or a physician. He says. Doctor might have been a, an ironic word to use in that case. So anyway, back to the beginning of the third act. Um, so they're looking for, they're looking for Peter. No, that's, <laughs> I keep jumping around. My brain is like trying to remember things. No, I think that's how, that's how we figure out that Ned has, you know, whatever the magic is that he does what I just wish I knew where Peter was. Like he kind of waves his hands like that and he has the ring on and it causes like they see like a little portal, just like a little like whatever. It looks like sparks whenever Dr. Strange opens one of those portals. And that's what you see, just like a little ring of sparks and then it goes away. And then they I guess they realize that, you know, that Ned can open portals. So they focus on Peter. They keep saying Peter Parker, Peter Parker, Peter Parker. And they're they're opening the portal. And then we see a Peter Parker off in the off in the distance. He's like looking. I mean, we see a Spider-Man, excuse me, off in the distance. He's like, you know, he's like, oh, what's that over there? And then they're calling out to him, Peter, Peter, come on, Peter. And so he comes to the portal and he jumps to the portal and it's Andrew Garfield. And the first time I watched it, the crowd started applauding. Uh, you know, it's cool. You know, it's you know, it's exciting, but I uh, I'm not I'm not at. I'm not at that stage where like I'm going to applaud something like that. No judgment. So they do the same thing. They say, "Okay, well this is not our Peter. We're going to keep doing it until we find our Peter." So they do it again and they find um uh, and then they find um <laughs> what's his name? Toby Maguire, Peter Parker from Sam Raimi um Sam Raimi Spider-Man. So I guess they stop there. They don't they don't summon any more Peters. Um, and based on what they learned from, you know, Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire, they all say like they have their special place that they like to go to get away from everything. And they keep they ask MJ. So does your Peter have a place like that? And they find out that he does. Um I'm going through my brain right now of all the ways that I, I could do this differently and how I'm probably going to do it differently in the future. But you know what? This is what it is. This is the learning process. The documented learning process. Um, 
So we have our we have our two um, interdimensional. Is that the right word? Multiverse. Multiversal Spider Man. And so they they help they help Ned and MJ find our Peter. And I'm 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 not going to go into detail because honestly, uh, like a lot of the details are are kind of fuzzy as I go into them. But basically, um, our multiversal Spider Men, I'll call them. Jesus, that's that's kind of clunky. They help Peter figure out how to get. Basically, all everything that's happened. Peter was trying to send all these villains home. But then we learned that by sending them home, they're basically going to die. And of course, they they fought back against that. And so what the three Peters figure out is how to cure them of all their conditions. Actually, I think they were trying to do that before that big uh, condo fight at um, at Happy Hogan's condo. Fuck. See, this really bothers me when I when I got little details like, wait, when did this happen? When did that happen? Because really, it's just it's kind of awkward. Because I don't know what to say, and I get kind of stuck. Um. It's funny. I'm, I'm going to say this right now. Of course, the first episode was very difficult to record, and I just stuck with it, and yeah, it went all right. The second episode I recorded a couple weeks ago. Oh, it just went easy. Of course, the different was the difference was is that I was just talking, and I had things to talk about because I hadn't been on the podcast for a while, so I just talked and I talked. Now. This is something new for me. I'm I'm you know, I got all these notes about the film and things I want to talk about. And it just doesn't feel as natural. And, you know, I'm, I'm noticing as I go into details on the film, I'm finding them kind of hazy. Maybe there's still some cannabis in my system. Um, so, yeah, the third act is basically about the three Spider-Man working together to figure out how to cure these villains and then send them home. I don't remember exactly what the explanation for that. Um, I I guess like they were they died in their universe and they they were just brought to our universe years later. You know, time and space thing going on there. Um, I don't know if they explained like. I guess. Okay, I'm gonna cure you, Electro. I'm gonna cure you of your whatever your electricity powers and then I'm going to send you back. So I guess that means he won't be electro anymore, but are you sending him back in the past? If the, if this was explained in the film, I was, I, I didn't hear it. Cause that, that was a little, that was a little question for me. Like there's, they're basically saying that it was some kind of time trial. And again, we're talking multiverse here. So time travel, whatever, it's all it's all on the board here. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if they explain that part. I'm sure, you know, maybe someone can correct me. <laughs> so, yeah, the. Uh, the film ends. Oh, yeah, one of the major plot points was. Like the first big villain, I mean the the like I said, the two big villains. I mean the two villains really in this film are Electro, and Green Goblin. The other, like I said, Doc Ock was just kind of he was just kind of there. Um, you know he had the fight in the beginning, and like I I forget I I know he kind of acts out a little bit towards the end, but for the most part, like he's on he's on Peter's side. Um, so it's it's uh, it's Electro and it's uh, Willem Dafoe, Green Goblin. It's Electro first. So speed us, uh, speeder, <laughs> speedo. 
So Peter has like the whatever the what's it called fabrication machine. I think it's I think that's the machine he used to make his suit in um in in Spider Man Far From Home. But yeah, basically it can make anything. So that's that's handy. But what um what electrical electrical <laughs> electrico what electro notices. And he even like he can feel it from the other room. He's like, there's something in there. And they, you know, they open up this fabrication machine and there's the arc reactor. And of course we've established in the MCU that the arc react the arc reactor is like this this massive power source. And so at the in the third in the third act when Electro shows up, he has the arc reactor and you know his his powers are just going insane. Um lot of lot of lot of fun little easter eggs and references in this film um i think i mentioned that previously but it doesn't get in the way in the film one thing that i thought was really fun that of course electro played by jamie fox um you know it was a modern electro in amazing spider-man 2 they're not going to do the corny old-fashioned one with the lightning bolt i mean for those of you that know the comic like yeah he looks super corny with like a lightning bolt like star around his around his face but what they did is like um electro when like his electricity is like you know kind of sparking out sparking out you can you can see that they kind of did that where it, it kind of highlights his face like that and i thought that was really cool that was one of jesus so many references they referenced toby Maguire's back they at one point toby Maguire is like because like i said andrew garfield is like He's insecure. And he's all like, I forget what it was. Yeah, no, like uh, the other two spider spider men, of course, you know, uh, Tom Holland, he went to he went to space and he fought an alien. He was part of the, the end game battle. And then Tobey Maguire, Spider-Man said that he fought an alien. And then Andrew Garfield, Spider-Man's like, I never fought an alien. And he starts getting down. Oh, you guys are so cool. I'm, I'm lame. Um. Yeah, the point of that, I'm fucking rambling. The point of that was that um, Tobey Maguire tells Andrew Garfield, you're amazing, man. You're amazing. And, uh, a little on the nose, but yeah, I thought that was cute. Um, but anyway, yeah, so they take out Flint Marco. They take out uh, who's Sandman. They take out Kurt Connors. They take out Electro. So they take out all the villains. You know, they take out... Um, I don't know if I said this already, but this this was a, a kind of a roundabout way of making a Sinister Six movie, except there's five of them. Honestly, I don't know why. I mean, they could have fit one more in there. As it was, I mean, Doc Ock, Electro, and Green Goblin were the main villains that were, that were um, focused on. The rest were, you know, kind of in the background. I mean, just put one more in there, even just as like another one in the background. So at least, you know, it would have been a Sinister Six movie. So at the end of the third act, you know, they defeat Electro. Um, I don't do they send everybody back? No, 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 no. Because they have the they have the. um the box which contains the the um the corrupted spell and apparently there's a button that you push the button and it sends everybody back to their universe of course if they do that without curing them they're gonna go right back to being dead which uh, i don't know whatever i mean i i need to get over that so at the end he fights he fights um he fights the green goblin the Green Goblin, which I don't know if I clarified that. Um, the Green Goblin, who is responsible for the death of Aunt May. And, of course, he's got vengeance on the mind. Um, and they fight. They fight on a giant Captain America shield that fell off of the Statue of Liberty. Okay, whatever. Reference. I guess that's a thing that's happening in the MCU. They're putting a uh, Captain America shield on the Statue of Liberty. 
So he fights him. He basically uh, defeats him, and he's like beating the shit out of him. And this is, you know, this is Peter's challenge. He's he's getting his revenge, but is he um, is he gonna give in to that that bloodlust, and is he gonna cross that line where he kills somebody? Which, of course, is always a, a big issue for a lot of heroes. Those who, you know, don't kill. And he, again, another callback reference. He's about to stab Green Goblin with his glider. And being impaled by the glider is how he died in the 2002 film. And as he's about to bring it down, um, I want to say Andrew Garfield, right? Who was it? To- I forget. Andrew McGuire, either or, um, stops him, gives him that talk. And I forget, <laughs> I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting all these little details. Somebody stabs him with the whatever, anti, you know, the cure, stabs him with the cure, the anti Green Goblin serum, I guess. And he's all back to normal. And so I guess everybody's back to normal. So they send everybody back to their, their, you know, their universe. And Doctor Strange is back because he's, you know, uh, Ned, like, I think Ned, yeah, Ned put him in a portal or something. I forget what happened. But yeah, they got rid of him somehow, which seemed very convenient because he's fucking Doctor Strange. I feel like he could have got through that. But again, it's it's one of those things, like, if you're going to pick apart every little detail, it's... You're going to find inconsistency, especially with something like this, with multiverse and uh, like rewriting. I mean, when you're talking about people re- forgetting who that, that Peter Parker is Spider-Man, it's like you're rewriting like the story. So, yeah, Spider-Man has defeated the Green Goblin. And he is stopped from killing him by the other Spider-Man. And so I suppose he's learned his lesson this one of the uh, this one of the descriptions says that he learns what it really means to be a Spider-Man, which I guess that's what it means is that a villain kills you know someone you care about very deeply, and you don't take that bloodlust revenge on him. That's what it means to be a Spider-Man, I suppose. Okay, so the uh, the dramatic climax is over. You know the villains. Everybody's been cured or sent home or defeated or, well, actually all of the above. And then it's just, um, it's Doctor Strange and still dealing with the, with the, with the uh, consequences. I'm trying to think of another word. Consequences of, of the spell that, that Peter messed up. He didn't cast it. He messed it up after it was cast. And so the it shows like the universe. It shows like cracks in the sky. I gotta work on my mic techniques. It's like when I move and stuff, I find myself going away from the mic. It shows all these cracks and stuff in the uh, in the sky. It, I mean, it looks like the universe is breaking, something like that. And it shows all these figures, like you know, coming towards the the opening. And what Doctor Strange says is that, you know, because you messed up that spell. Now everybody from every verse who knows Peter Parker is Spider-Man is coming here. And just, you know, just from a layman's perspective, I don't live in the MCU, but just on a physics level, I got to imagine that's got to be some kind of, I don't know, world breaking thing. Anyway, that's not important. Um, one thing I noticed when the sky was opening up and it showed all these figures walking, well, not walking, whatever, just figures moving towards the uh, towards the opening. I swear I saw I saw an outline of Craven, which you know, kind of cool. Maybe a tease for a future film. Um. So yeah. You 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 uh. You broke the universe. You broke the multiverse, Peter. All these people are coming here. And then Peter Parker says, okay, well, how about you cast another spell which says everybody forgets who Peter Parker is. 
And then, you know, you know, Dr. Strange tells him, well, you realize that means all your friends, all your loved ones, anyone you know is going to forget who you are. And he says, yeah. Which, of course, this is an arc. This is an arc from, you know, the beginning of the film where he just wanted to fix his problems, which, you know, caused, which, you know, led to all these problems. But now, as he's grown through this, you know, through this story, through this situation, now he's ready to take that burden on him. He's going to fix the multiverse, I guess, by sacrificing his his identity, I guess, if you look at it that way. Which means he'll, you know, no one's going to know he's Peter Parker. MJ, his girlfriend, is not going to know he's Peter Parker. His best, his best friend, Ned. <clears throat> happy hogan you know the the list continues and so um i was warned about this final scene i mean it's not the final final scene but um i was warned by, by uh i was warned about this scene that uh it's a tearjerker um i didn't cry the first time i watched the movie uh when i watched it earlier today i did i you know tear too it's very touching um there's the back of my head. I want to I wanna tell you how it didn't work for me. But I'm, I'm going to save that for last. Pros and cons. So, yeah, he says goodbye. He says goodbye to MJ and Ned in a very emotional, heartbreaking scene. And he tells, he tells MJ, you know, I'll find you. And he does afterwards. She doesn't know who the hell he is, but he finds her. Okay, so we end, we end the film in... Um, in this crappy New York apartment, which, you know, I love it. That's that's so Spider-Man. And then they show him um, they show a sewing machine with the the blue and red uh, fabric material where they show he's been he's been uh, whatever knitting, sewing his uh, his new costume. And then they show him, you know, walking, going out the window in that costume. It's it's very retro. It's clear. It's clearly they're they're rebooting this uh this entire this entire Spider-Man storyline with uh they're they're rebooting it to a more classic to a more classic Spider-Man, which, you know, I'm on board. Um I I'm going to say it. I don't I don't know if I like the uh the kind of metallic shiny blue in his costume i know that's i know that's that's you know like i said that's kind of classic spider-man i don't know if it it just i don't know, it feels kind of out of place in this universe they're going forward with this franchise and like i said they're rebooting it to more so they're gonna do something different with the next franchise which of course makes sense because you know, I was thinking about this like, OK, they've had these three films. They've been successful. Of course, they're going to go forward with the franchise. Are they going to keep doing the same thing? No, they're not. It doesn't seem like they are. Um, they're going classic. And so that's that's the closing scene of the film. Oh, my God. Have I finally gotten here? Basically shows him going out, swinging around and kind of dive bombing right into the camera. Boom. Credits. So yeah, the film ends there. We cut to credits. Um, I didn't stick around today. I didn't stick around for the post credit scene. Um, I did the first time around. Honestly, I don't remember what they were. I pretty sure one of them was Venom, which of course makes sense. I know there was a post credit scene. Over here, scratching my ear. I know there was a post credit scene after uh, after Carnage, and I don't remember what that was. I know. One of these films had a post credit scene where, you know, um, Tom Hardy, Venom, is like laying in bed in the tropics and then something weird happens to the TV or something weird happens to the world. And I'm guessing this has something to do with the multiverse and what what, uh, you know, what Doctor Strange and Spider-Man did. And then all of a sudden he sees Spider-Man on the TV. No, that was that was at the end of Venom that I remember now that was at the end of Venom. Which made me wonder, like, okay, but that happened before this. Well, in the timeline of the MCU, that it's probably right in line. I'm pretty sure that was after Venom. And God help me, I don't remember what the post credit scenes were this. Maybe it was that one. I 
all, all the little things that in the future I'm going to I'm going to research the details in uh in a in a more thorough manner. So anyway, that was the post credit scene, I think. So I'm going to go to um I'm going to go to, let me look at my notes here. The theme. What is the theme of this, of this movie? Um, I'm sure a, a more intelligent film goer, someone who's more familiar with screenwriting and such could tell me a number of things. Um, I mean, the one thing I take away from it is growth. Spider-Man grew. I mean, that's generally the case in a in most movies. Your protagonist goes through something and they grow from it. But I, I'm reminded of that line, and I saw the description that I saw in the description of the film is that Peter Parker learns what it truly means to be a Spider-Man. Um, so it's about growth, and it's about. I want to say letting go. It's about accepting his role. I think that's, I mean, that was the, I think that was the arc that was communicated in that scene where he tells Dr. Strange to tell, to cast the spell for everyone to forget who Peter Parker is. That was his arc. Yeah, I, I said that, I said that earlier. He's taken responsibility for everything, maybe things beyond his control. There's a number of times in the film where he says, um, yeah, at one point he tells the other two Spider-Men that this is not my problem. This is not my responsibility. I'm going to send them back, and if you kill them, that's on you. Um, and so there's there's moments in this film where he's not taking responsibility. And at the end, he takes, I mean, weight of the world might be a strong term. Sacrifice. I mean, that's a lot of this, a lot of this, uh, this whole franchise, this whole trilogy. And it's very Spider-Man is about Spider-Man can't have his own life. In the first one, in Homecoming, he like he wants to hook up with that, I forget what that girl's name is, I, obviously. The Vulture's daughter, whatever her name was. Um, he, wanted, he wanted to hook up with her. He wanted to have his own life. But no, Spider-Man kept getting in the way. So... At the, I mean, it sounds kind of sad, but he learned that he can't have his own life. Great power, great responsibility, right? He had to sacrifice his friends, his girlfriend. One, to save the multiverse. I guess that was the only reason. Because it's not like, usually, like, I mean, many superheroes, like in superhero stories and spider-man like they don't they don't want the people closest to them to know who they are because if anyone else finds out then those people are a target i mean it's you know common storytelling thing when it comes to like a secret identity and such so themes of the film growth sacrifice responsibility of course those are could be considered interchangeable in uh in a lot of cases and i think that uh that that uh that feeds into the to the title of the film i mean that just kind of came to me like a little while ago well i mean hours ago after the movie <laughs> when i was setting this up is that spider-man no way home has a double meaning I mean, it's it's kind of like no way home, meaning it's whatever. It's kind of like a question mark. Like, am, is he able to get all these people home to their own universe? Um, 
but I think the other the other meaning of that of that title is that Peter doesn't get to have a home. He doesn't get to go home. He has a home now. He's got a little crappy apartment in New York. But his girlfriend, his best friend, his aunt's dead. Happy Hogan doesn't know who he is. Nobody knows who he is. So he doesn't get to go home. That's kind of the that's kind of the sad truth of the superhero is that they have to take on they have to take on that burden because of that gift that they were given, that ability they have to help people. They help everybody else, but they don't help themselves. Oh my god, that's a theme in my life. Which I'm working on. Anyway, moving on. <clears throat> pros and cons. Let's get to pros and cons. I talked about the theme. I talked about the double meaning of the title. What did I like in this film? I mean, I'm sure I, I talked about it. Um, so I'm sure I'm going to repeat myself a little bit here. So bear with me. Pardon me. Um... So what did I like? I see I mentioned I mentioned a lot of this already. I mentioned Sinister Six. This is like a Sinister Six movie, which is which is a lot of fun. Like in Amazing Spider Man two, they were setting up the Sinister Six, but it was just like Oscorp created everything. It's kinda lame. This is a Sinister Six movie without having to to um set up any of those other characters because they've been set up in other films. I wonder how many people, I mean, obviously all the superhero movie fans and Spider-Man fans have seen the old film, but I wonder how many of like, especially the younger generation have seen those older films, especially the, the Raimi ones. The most recent one is what? 15 years. Yeah. 15 years old at this point. Um, so yeah, the sinister six, the spider verse, which is, basically the same thing i don't know if this is considered i mean it's not a spider verse like the animated spider verse but it's basically i mean it's a multiverse for everybody so it's not just a spider verse it's going to be a whatever insert um insert your favorite character character's name here verse um let me let me talk about the multiverse real quick uh just i mean multiverse in general i mean mcu multiverse is open they teased it in far from home they they said that you know mysterio was from a, a multiverse I, he said that but of course he was full of shit he was fooling everybody but they teased the multiverse the multiverse is open now you know dr strange Two is the multiverse of madness, and I'm I am looking forward to that film. Um, so the multiverse is the multiverse is real, real in um in the Marvel Cinematic Universe (MCU) and the DC Extended Universe (DCEU). So of course, you know, we just had you know No Way Home, which pulled old characters from old movies from another universe which you know of course is neat um michael keaton is going to be in the flash as you know the old 89 batman which i mean as an older guy that's that, that kind of gives me the nerd chills too but again it it has to be done in such a way where it's not just about like you know nerdgasm aspects of the film it has to be a good film it has to you know i need to connect it with it on uh connect with it on an emotional level but no just getting back to multiverses um it's so exciting what they can do i guess it's it's so exciting the possibilities are exciting because the possibilities are infinite However, <laughs> but I worry about that because, you know, whatever I think about, I think about Hollywood and I think about, you know, how a lot of these movies are made, um, how decisions are made. And I just feel like, 
I feel like it's a bubble. It's going to be a bubble. Like all this cool shit is going to happen. All this cool shit is going to happen. They're going to have all these interconnecting universes and all this. I said it how many times? All this cool shit is going to happen. At some point, I feel like that bubble is going to burst. I mean, not like, oh, you know, multiverses are going to be over or anything. But I feel like it's one of those things that they're just going to saturate. They're just going to have so much fun with it because they can do anything with it. I'm thinking about a Hollywood executive thinking about, I want this person in my film. Well, he's not from the same universe or from even the same franchise. But if it's the same character, I can pull that person into my film. And again, it worked. As far as the multiverse stuff, it worked like fucking gangbusters in this movie. It worked. It worked fine. It worked great. I just I just worry. I just worry with that, that, you know, it's basically a blank check. It's a blank check of what you can do with these characters and with these universes. And I'm just concerned at some point. Not like it's I I don't know. I'm making it sound like it's all going to get to a point. It's all going to collapse. No. Obviously, some studios, some production companies are going to do it better than others. The cream will rise to the top. But I just I foresee like so many like because that's a selling point. Oh, we've got all these characters. Oh, all this nerdgasm stuff. Let's pull these characters together. Isn't that exciting? Yes, it is. But when you take that one thing and I'll just throw this in my movie to get people to watch it. But then the rest of the movie is like, eh. It's going to be disappointing. But again, I'll just, you know, I'll have to take my own counsel on which which of these films I watch and I don't. I mean, it's up to me. I, I just I, I just wanted to touch on that point. Because, yeah. I'm excited for the multiverse and I'm a little trepidatious about what might be done with these multiverse stories. Um, moving on. Have I got to pros and cons? Yes, I was in the middle of pros. Um, uh, Spider Verse stuff was fun. The movie. I mean, this has been this has been true of the entire franchise. But it's fun. It's cute. It's funny. They're mostly. I mean, obviously, not obviously, but, you know, as the as the franchise has progressed and things had to get more dramatic, it got a little darker in some places, especially this film. Um, But ultimately, these. Ultimately, these are these are comedies. I want to say this one had I feel like I feel like the first one and again. The story got more dramatic. The story got more serious as time went on. Went on, but yeah, I definitely I maybe I gotta I'll look back. But I I remember like Homecoming being probably the funniest. But I think that was kind of the point, not the point of that film, but that was the tone they wanted to set, and they set a great tone. So the movie's fun. It's cute. Uh, a lot of great action. Action in service of the story, not just action for the sake of action, engaging action. You know what's going on. See, I'm looking I'm looking at all this stuff that I listed as far as um, things I like and I don't like. And I, I mentioned most of them. I mentioned how I like I'm going to say it again. I liked Andrew Garfield. I, I feel like he was a stand. I'm, I'm not going to say sh- he stole the show or anything. It's kind of hard. I mean, they're only in the third act. The the multiverse Spider Man only show up in the third act, so they didn't have a whole bunch of. But I mean, in that third act, of course, the movie's two and a half hours long. I don't recall how long the third act was. They have plenty of time to play off each other, and really, it works. I mean, just to expand on, I mean, I liked Tobey Maguire. He was fine. He's looking fucking old, but. <laughs> I don't know how old. I mean, this joke was made about him like 20 years ago. Maybe not at the very beginning, but that was always the joke about the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man. It's like he didn't look like a fucking high school kid. Um, And he 
definitely looks like someone who didn't look like a high school kid 20 years ago. I'm not saying he looks bad. So I wonder, so I'm guessing there's spy, there's uh, space time stuff going on here. So, you know, you go to a multiverse in one time, you show up in the other multiverse in the universe at another time. They didn't touch on it, but I, I would, I'm, I, I want to say that Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man is older. I mean, clearly he looks older, but they didn't, again, when it comes to the multiverse and all these technical little details, like, I'm just curious, but what about this? What about that? I try not to go into it too much because if you just pick the, you pick the film apart, like, I mean, it's, it's a superhero movie, right? There's going to be unbelievable things in it. It's kind of the point. Um, as long as long as the film is engaging and enjoyable, a lot of this stuff is forgivable. It's when, you know, when a film is not so enjoyable that it's it's just it's fun to tear everything about tear everything apart. Um, but, yeah, just to get back to Garfield and McGuire real quick, um, they were both they were both good. Garfield was great, in my opinion. What little we had of him, the way he was written and the way and his performance um, I mean, generally speaking, he's he's probably the best actor um, among this. I mean, no, I'm going to say it. Uh, yeah, I think Andrew Garfield is probably the best actor among the three. Tobey Maguire. Uh, I don't recall much of his work beyond Spider-Man. I know he did a film called I think it was called Brothers. Co-starring co-starring Jake Gyllenhaal, by the way. I think I think it was Jake. Was it Jake Gyllenhaal? That's funny now. I don't. Anyway, I know it was Tobey Maguire. He was in a film called Brothers where he was. Uh, he was in the army or something. I think he was in Iraq and he get he got captured and like whatever. He was a prisoner for a long time. He got tortured and he came home and acted crazy. And like his performance, like he his performance was really good in that movie. He seemed crazy. And especially for like Tobey Maguire, who's usually all, you know, G golly and stuff. It was it was kind of. Uh, it was a refreshing new look at him as an actor. Jamie Foxx was good. Um, I think it was better that he was, you know, basically a human being for most of the film. So you could appreciate his acting more. Like when he was in Amazing Spider-Man 2, he was like this all energy being, he's all CGI. And it was kind of, I mean, I'm sure it was like motion capture or something like that. But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't as engaging. And of course, that wasn't as engaging a film either. So, but yeah, Jamie Foxx, of course, is a great actor. Um, very, uh, very menacing as a villain. Willem Dafoe was great, but, you know, he's always great. Again, uh I mean, he's like he's up there as far as actors. He's been around forever, and he's he's an amazing actor. Uh, before I get to the con, oh man, I'm avoiding these cons, and I haven't written written them down. I think once I get going, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna start going into them. Okay, so Spider Man's age in regard to this. I was thinking about this because I thought like, okay, so Homecoming came out in 2017. Um, Far From Home came out in 2019. Yeah, 2019. Yeah, same. Yeah, it came out right after uh, Endgame. And then here we are. Far From Home came out in 2021. So, you know, two-year gap between movies. That's usually how it goes. I was wondering about Peter Parker's age. I remember, I thought he said 16, but no, in um, in Homecoming, he, he says he's 15. And so in Far From Home, he's 17. Far From Home is set in. God, that's that's a freaking. That's that's kind of a mind job, too. So Far From Home. <laughs> oh, my God. Fucking Infinity Gaunt gauntlet snaps and multiverses I, I didn't even think about this so yeah so far from home 
takes place in 2024 after after Endgame, after they bring everybody back from the snap, everybody who was blipped. So does this... Well, no, this has... No, so this film... Okay, I, I got it, guys. I got it. So this film... Because this film takes place literally... I mean, the end of Far From Home and the beginning of this film overlap. So this film is kind of is concurrent with Far From Home. So in Homecoming, I believe he's 15. Far From Home, he's 17, which I guess in this film, he's still 17. Because they're, I, you know, I'm guessing senior in high, senior year in high school, they're applying to colleges doing that uh high school senior thing so i guess now it seems like that was the that's probably what they wanted to do with this franchise they started out with young happy-go-lucky peter parker just happy to be hanging out with tony stark and the avengers to three years later you know he's he's college age he's grown up there's another question he's gonna go to college you know what? I just probably, since they're rebooting it to a more classic Spider-Man, he's probably gonna go to college in New York somewhere. Like Empire, he he goes to like NYU or Empire State University. Someone can. I remember that from from the the '90s cartoon. Not the comics. So yeah, so Spider-Man has grown up through these films, and then we get to like like it appears we're going to see the reboot and the adult Spider-Man in future films. So I, I just wanted to cover on that because I was, I was thinking about her, like how old is he? Cause he's still, obviously it's been five years since uh homecoming. And it, you can tell these actors look significantly older. I noticed, I don't know if it was, it was filmed at a different time, but like the last scene it wasn't the very last scene, but when um, when Spider-Man uh, Peter Parker goes to talk to MJ, like after everybody after the spell has been cast and everybody's forgotten him and he's trying to, you know. He's trying to. He said he's going to make her remember him. We'll see. It's probably going to happen somehow or another. Um, but I noticed in that scene, he looks significantly older. And of course, I mean, it can't be like a year or two between production of the first recorded first shot scenes and the end shot scene. But I noticed in that last scene, he looks, for lack of a better term, he looks like a man. He looks like a young man, but he looks like a man. He's a very, uh, I mean, he's a very baby face individual. I mean, he's young, and I'm sure that's part of the reason why they, you know, they tapped him to be Spider-Man because he looks like a freaking kid. And, you know, they got how many years out of him because he's so young. So he still looks young, but there's something in his face in that scene. It's like, you know, and it's not like it's not like some some ag abstract figurative like, oh, he's grown. I can see it in his eyes. No, like his actual like physical face. It looks matured in that scene. I don't know why it was it was sticking out to me. Um, so we're done with the age. OK, final. <laughs> Ooh, I've been putting this part off. What I didn't really connect with. Um, oh, one last thing before I get to that. Oh, I'm still putting it off. So Spider-Man has a hybrid suit in this in this film. As I said previously, um, he has that fight with Doc Ock and Doc Ock pulls off the nanotech and then a the nanotech takes over Doc Ock's arms. And then after he um, cures Doc Ock, he um, he fixes that 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 uh, inhibitor chip on his on his whatever in his octopus arms. And now he's normal. Um, Doc Ock puts the nanotech like back to him, which I don't know how he had control over that. But anyway. 
so all that nanotech goes back onto spider he's wearing the he's wearing the far from home suit the kind of the black and red one right yeah i think so um and it kind of goes i don't know it makes this funky like spider-man design it looks really cool i mean as far as i can tell it was just an excuse to get another spider-man suit out of the deal um because i was like wow that's kind of cool i wonder if they're going to do something with that i mean i don't know how a nanotech and normal suit hybrid would be any better than a completely nanotech suit but i just felt like they were going to do something with that like oh that suit is going to have this ability because generally speaking like usually when there's a new suit there's something new about it um so that i don't know that that kind of bugged me a little bit not a huge deal okay i am ready to talk bad about this film I'm kidding. Not talk bad. Okay, at long last, I've gotten to the final segment of this episode, the segment I've been avoiding because I'm going to express some <laughs> some negative opinions about this film. Not really this film specifically, but just this franchise as a whole. And not really this franchise, just Tom Holland. And I know, like, I mean, obviously, he's done so well in the MCU, and everybody loves him. Um, and so I feel bad speaking ill. But something something kind of became clear to me recently as I watch this film, and I think about uh, previous films. I like him. I I really, I mean, he works great. As the G golly sidekick, you know, little kid hanging out with the, you know, hanging out with Tony Stark and the adult Avengers. He works great as that. Um, he worked great as, you know, dying in Tony's arms. Spoilers. And there's some sirens. Can you hear that? It's just in this film and basically all the previous films the you know the two previous films i'm not talking about like i said not the i i he look he works great in the team up films it's like whenever things are dark and spider-man is troubled and and i'm not saying it's his acting it's just whatever i don't know maybe because he's such a baby-faced boy and I, I get it. I get it. That's part of the point because he's a he's a young kid Spider-Man. And usually that's where Spider-Man starts in high school. It's not his performance. It's just I don't know. I just I don't connect with him in those scenes. And I mean, so so there it is. I, I'm going to go through. I, I don't know. I mean, I distinctly remember Homecoming. I mean, the the big, the big dark moment, the the you know the arc. No, it's not really an arc. But the you know the low point that he has to overcome is he's trapped under a building. Which is, he's he's trapped so much that even Spider Man is too much for even Spider Man to lift. But of course, you know he has that moment. He looks down in the pond. He sees like his mask covering half his face they did that in this film too that's a great spider-man uh easter egg the whole cover with uh peter parker's face and uh the other the other half of his face is the, is the mask but you have that moment in homecoming and you know he overcomes and he rawr, he lifts his way out of there i i wouldn't say I, I didn't connect with that moment at all i just didn't connect with it that much I, again, I don't know why. I can't really, I I can't I can't point to a moment in uh, Far From Home. I mean, towards the end, when when you know things are getting rough. I guess I don't. Again, I don't recall any specific moment in that film. Um. In this film, either. I mean, 
you know, any moment that that bothered me. I mean, there's moments like he had the, you know, he had the tearful, the tearful uh, farewell to MJ and Ned. I felt that probably could have felt it more. Like I said, I shed a tear in that moment. But any time that things are tough or things. Tom Holland can't go dark, I guess. And I'm not saying he can't. In my opinion, it just doesn't do it for me. I don't know why. Um, so that's my opinion. Again, I've enjoyed this franchise. I own Homecoming and Far From Home on uh, on Voodoo. But I think it was it was it was after Far From Home that I guess the cracks you started to appear for me. Cuz I watched that movie, I was like, "Yeah, it was kind of fun." It felt kind of empty though. Of course, well, I think one thing that movie had going against it it just happened to come after Endgame, which currently sits as the highest growing movie of all time. I, I don't know, over $2 billion, I'm guessing. And, of course, the massive uh, climax it was to a 10-year storyline. Spider-Man Far From Home had the uh, unenviable task of following that movie. And, of course, you know, that's not what they're They're not, they're not going to, obviously, they're not going to. They're not going to outdo Endgame. They're not going to go bigger than Endgame. Um, so maybe that's not fair. But I think that was that was part of the reason that like that 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 film kind of fell flat for me. I guess no, not not because of. I think that, like I said, that was one thing working against it that it followed Endgame. I don't think that's why I. And again, I'm not going to say I didn't like that movie. Again, it's just like, eh, it's just something missing. Something's not doing it for me. But I think that one's especially, if 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 I had to rank them right now, Far From Home would be my least favorite. I don't know. And again, I mean, I'm sure some people would be like, dude, you're crazy. No Way Home is the best. And I'm sure after a while, I'm probably I probably will agree. But for right now, I'm 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 uh I'm reserving judgment. But yeah, just to um just just to close up on this thought, is that the only thing that I didn't like about this movie? Yeah, little technical things, like I said, um, the movie's two and a half hours long, which. The, the the runtime works for it. I think there's some parts where like they're really taking their time and I'm thinking to myself, like, this could be tightened up or cut a little bit to make this movie, you know, move. I wanna say like like middle like I think in each act I had a moment where like, you know what, this could be sped up a little bit. I, I yeah, I don't recall exactly when, but that that was one thing, the pacing. And again, very little bit, very minimal. There was a few there was a few moments and scenes where I thought they were taking too much time and it could have um it could have been uh tightened up a little bit. I I guess I know I was going to say all these things I don't like. I think it's just it's just that it's just eh, something about something about Tom Holland. Maybe I'm mad at him because he's in a crappy Uncharted movie. I'm kidding. But yeah, I'm not I'm not watching that movie. I love Uncharted and There's very few things where I'm like nerd about and I'm like, ooh, they, they didn't honor the, the source material or some shit like that. Uh Uncharted. Not that they have to honor the source material, but once I saw like Mark Wahlberg as Sully, I'm like, nope, I'm done. I'm out. I'm good. I'm not watching that movie. <laughs> But yeah, back to Tom Holland, just, eh, just something, something's missing there for me. And maybe as he gets older, maybe, you know, maybe he'll get it. Maybe he'll outgrow that freaking baby face. Um, but for right now, and again, I've never seen him in anything I, 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 you know, I see, I see his face on other films. And you know I might want I you know I might check them out at some point, 
But I just, I don't know. I'm sorry, Tom Holland. I'm really, I, I know that you're really worried about my opinion, but I'm sorry. I'm going to wrap this up. I fuck. I've been talking for, I don't know what time it is right now. I'm going to check the time. It's almost midnight now. I started this around seven and I don't mean recording. I just started like start setting up like fucking setting up and get my camera and all that shit took me almost two hours. Again, like I said, I I need to get this fucking tightened down. I mean, obviously the camera is set up and that's funny because, you know, this is a podcast and it's available uh, just about everywhere. Audio podcasts are found. However, it's also available on YouTube, and the video portion is important to me. It seems like I spent a lot of time on that when I could just sit down and record a podcast. But ultimately, that's what I'm going to do. I just need to get to the point where I know where that tripod goes and how it's set, and that's it. I put it down, and that's it. Because this is madness. I've spent like fucking five hours of my evening doing this shit. This stuff, it's not shit. This is me learning. So, yeah, I just wanted to say that. I. So that means I've been recording for three hours. And there's all kind of mistakes and all kind of like awkward ends and there's going to be cuts and I'm not looking forward to editing this video. But you know what? I need to learn. I need to fucking learn. So let's do this. Oh. Well, <laughs> at long last. This has been the Larth Media Podcast, episode 003, Revenge of the Larth. Um, do I put, like, the summary? Well, I guess I, I'd put the summary in, like, the show notes or something. This has been podcast, episode 003, where Larth talks about, you know, Spider-Man, No Way Home. So, yeah, that has been the podcast. Uh, my name is Lathan Minnick, a.k.a. Larth. It's been a long, tiring night. Once again, I'm going to give out the the contact info. I'm looking at another word here, and it's throwing me off. I'm going to give out the contact info. Uh, reach me by email, larthmedia at gmail.com. All the social media outlets is going to be Larth Media, at Larth Media on Twitter, on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook page, um, Facebook fan page, facebook.com slash Larth Media. As I said, this is on video as well as audio, so it's on my YouTube channel. Search for Larth Media. I look forward to getting a, uh, a custom URL for that. Once again, this is the Larth Media Podcast, episode 003, Revenge of the Larth. I am Lathan Minnick, a.k.a. Larth. I want to thank you all for listening or watching or watching, if you're listening and watching. And whatever you're doing, whatever you're going through, whoever you love, don't forget to love yourself. Take care. And that's it. MJ's dead. Um. I can't believe I just said that. <laughs> <laughs>